You. Let's go live to Andrew Clennell, our political editor, who was in that news conference. A great uh, moment for Peter Dutton, a huge roll of the dice. We've spoken, you and I, over years about small target oppositions. This opposition is not a small target, Andrew. It's not indeed. It's a nuclear target. What about this? This is a historic announcement. This will go down the annals of Australian political history, whichever way it goes. This announcement at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Offices in Sydney uh, this morning, Kieran, and th the size of this announcement, uh, and yet no costs, no costings on the announcement. I find that absolutely extraordinary. He says, don't worry about that. That'll come later. So Peter Dutton talking, confirming to us there seven power plants. He's about building the Commonwealth building and operating in Australia between 2035 and 2050. The most radical reshape he's talking about, in it, probably in Australia's energy policy history, and confirming that it's now going to be a referendum on nuclear power this election. This just turns everything on its head, this announcement this morning. But I was flummoxed, to say the least, by the fact he didn't put any sort of rough costings, having said he's building seven power plants if elected. Here was uh, my exchange with the opposition leader earlier. This is the biggest announcement I can remember for a federal opposition. Why can't you come to us with a cost on this? Do you believe the CSIRO's $8 billion cost? We'll, we'll, we'll deal with the cost uh, in the next stage of uh, our uh, policy announcements, but today um, I want the very clear focus to be on the fact that the sites we're proposing uh, end-of-use coal-fired power station sites. I mean, Kieran, you talk about small targets, big targets. We saw uh, Bill Shorten it, it make a pretty big target and lose in 2019, but this is more reminiscent in its size and controversy, uh, controversy I think, of, of the 1993 John Hewson fight-back campaign. And I actually put that to the opposition leader. He said he'd leave the commentary to others. Already he's got a roadblock in all these premiers, Labor premiers saying, well, they, they won't lift their nuclear bans. There is a way around that if you get a federal mandate, I believe, anyway. And Peter Dutton pointed this out. What will happen in Osborne, where Premier Malinowskis signed up to the AUKUS deal? There will be a reactor there where submariners in Australian uniforms will be sleeping in the submarine alongside the reactor in a safe way. In Henderson, in WA, uh, then Premier McGowan signed up to the AUKUS deal, where the nuclear reactors in the submarines will be there alongside residential and industrial areas. Uh, so those premiers have shown a level of pragmatism. Before we signed up to AUKUS, nobody believed that it could happen. Everyone said that the premiers wouldn't agree to it. They did. Uh, so we'll work with the premiers because it's in our national interest. All right, so the seven sites are Liddell Power Station, New South Wales in the Hunter, Mount Piper in New South Wales in the Hunter, Loyang in Victoria, Tarong in Queensland, Calite in Queensland, Northern Power in South Australia, Mudja Power Station in Western Australia. He'll have to compulsorily acquire most of them. AGL, who owns Loyang and Liddell, didn't know anything about this announcement, I'm told. So you'd be looking at compulsory acquisition or a significant... Uh, some paid to them to get hold of the sites in the first instance. But here, you know, it was unclear at first because he's talking about two modular reactors initially. But he makes clear here he wants all seven sites to have a nuclear reactor. All seven. Let's hear him talk about that. And he reckons they can be done by 2050. Are you talking about seven nuclear power plants or the opportunity for seven nuclear no, power plants? No, we're talking about seven, seven, power plant, seven nuclear power plants. We've identified those sites. Uh, we want to utilise the end-of-life coal-fired power station sites because the poles and wires already exist. So we say between 2035 and, 30, uh, 2035 and 37, depending on uh, which technology you use, uh, and then out into the 2040s, so ahead of 2050. Uh, and that is achievable. It's a sensible rollout. So the, the magnitude of this, Andrew, I think you've captured it uh, beautifully, really, in terms of how historic this is. The shift as well, and, and this was something that was... Um, you spoke about fight back and the, the, the potential comparisons to opposition policies in the past, but what I was thinking about repeatedly here is this is the party of, of small government 
uh, nationalising the energy assets once again. It's, it's an extraordinary day in our political debate as well in that sense, Andrew. I think it is incredible because uh, previously you've had states over the last couple of decades, and I've covered a lot of this, selling off their power generation assets. Uh, New South Wales, for example, Victoria under Jeff Kennett, Queensland, Peter Dutton's home state, significantly haven't. But now you're talking about not the states taking them over again, but the federal government taking them over again. And I guess, uh, you know, Peter Dutton would argue, well, the states are doing things like they're paying money for erraring to keep going, which is essentially kind of renationalising it. But nevertheless, it is a departure. It shows the strength of support in the coalition for nuclear that they're going to such extreme lengths, not just relying on the private sector, saying the private sector will do it, because obviously they think that argument would be shot down. But again, it shows the influence of the nationals in the coalition, I believe, too, because you point out rightly, it's not the natural Liberal Party thing to do. It is a National Party thing to do. But interesting here, too, Peter Dutton really... Uh, taking it on in a, in a brave, courageous, you might say, in Yes Minister Parlance fashion. When Chris Bowen says it's a referendum on nuclear, he didn't bother saying, yes, it's on nuclear, but it's on cost of living uh, and all these other issues, defence, whatever. He said, yeah, bring it on. I'm very happy for the election to be a referendum uh, on energy, on nuclear, on power prices, on lights going out, on who has a sustainable pathway for our country going forward. Peter Dutton there at a huge news conference, Andrew. Um, I'm going to check in with Chris Yorman in a moment, but just to wrap up this hour, uh, historic in the sense of the gamble, a huge structural shift if they do succeed, and as you say, it will go down in our uh, political annals as a momentous day for coalition policy in our political debate. It's going to dominate so much of our work and our coverage over the next six to 12 months, Andrew? As it should. It's such a big shift. And I'm surprised, in a way, he could have talked about two or three nuclear power stations on seven sites. He didn't. He could have talked about just lifting the moratorium and see if there's private sector investment. He didn't. He committed to seven nuclear power plants from zero in Australia. <laughs> It's, it's an extraordinary promise from opposition and one he makes at a time where he's making ground in the polls, Kieran. He's inching closer mm. to certainly putting Labor in minority, potentially establishing minority for himself. So what happens here? Does he get a bump from this because initially because people support it before a scare campaign or does this halt the uh, extension of the coalition parties in the polls? And what does it do to election timing? Does Anthony Albanese now have an excuse to go later this year and say, well, he wants a referendum on nuclear, I'll give it to him? Andrew, we'll talk to you at the top of the hour.